The Floyds started rehearsals in earnest at an Air Force base in San Bernardino, California in March. The enormous globe stage modelled on the Hollywood Bowl was prized into the corner of the biggest aircraft hangar in the States. The first night of the show in Miami's Joe Robbie Stadium was greeted by an unseasonal downpour, but it still won the hearts of one of the most loyal followings in rock. After becoming the most successful tour in the States, the band, stage and crew moved to Europe to wow crowds here. wound up in London with a record-breaking 14 nights in London to Earl's Court with all profits to go to charity. Charity. Whose idea was that, and why are you doing it? Uh, I think it was a, a sort of a group agreement, really, between um, Rick, Dave, and myself. Uh, we've always—I say always, generally in the past—we've, um, at some point during the tour, we've done a free concert, something similar. In fact, last time it was the, the Venice show, and we certainly looked to do something similar on this tour. Uh, but there was nothing really that was practical that really worked, and and so on. We were talking a bit more about working in London and so on. And it actually seemed a nicer idea to do these shows for charity rather than do a big, it more or less comes out to the same thing really. But this gives each of the charities an opportunity to raise their profile slightly. How did you choose the charities? Um, on a fairly sort of personal basis really, of um, charities quite often that we'd done work for before, either as individuals or as a band. Um, I think and most of them have some sort of personal uh, reason spread amongst us um, for the choice. And I have to say there are inevitably a whole bunch of charities that uh, we'd love to have done something for and didn't. I mean, I think uh, charities got missed out because we didn't think of them at the right moment. And uh, there was also a feeling that really you, you could spread it too thin in order to, for it to really be of benefit to the individual charities. It, it wouldn't really work to have a hundred charities all going in we, a little bit. Just when it seemed the Floyd were charmed, it all went wrong. Two blocks of seating at Earl's Court collapsed, throwing hundreds of people to the floor. The show was halted and 36 fans were taken to hospital. Luckily, all were out within days with no serious injuries. I heard a noise that um, I thought was a fault on the PA or something. It sounded like a big crackling noise, but... Uh... And um, then the house lights came on and I started grumbling at people why they turned the house lights back on again. And uh, then someone told me what had happened. It was very unfortunate. Um, we were very fortunate that there weren't more serious injuries. Awful. Absolutely terrible. And I just started playing and then the house lights came up and I assumed that someone in the house lights had got the wrong cue and I carried on a bit and then everyone was saying stop, stop, stop. And then the worst bit was going backstage waiting to hear what had, well, we knew what had happened, but how bad it was. And it really shook us up for a, a couple of days. I think um, that our people who did the talking to the audience and the uh, Red Cross people um, and all the emergency service re reacted very quickly and very, very efficiently. It seemed to be dealt with 
admirably. But it would have been better if it hadn't happened at all. The Arts Court shows featured a return to Pink Floyd's history with a performance of the complete dark side of the moon. We were not exactly getting bored, but we wanted to, to do more things, try new things out, and that seemed like a that would be really good fun. That would have been um, it would have been too much work on the last tour to, uh, with everything else that was going on and putting it all together, um, to have done this. But on this one, we've you know had a bit more time because. Uh, for the actual musicians and for me and, and Nick and Rick, there's a little less for us to do in terms of um, stress and, and worry and getting it all together uh, initially. So we initiated a look through all our old stuff, finding out films and, and finding old sound effects tapes and stuff and thought, well, that would be, if we could do it, we would, we would give it a try. And we found all the bits we needed or made some new bits um, and put it together. It's, it's quite, a, quite a sort of emotional moment the first oh, time sure, we did yeah, it. Yeah. And how does it feel now, 20 years later? I mean, obviously, it's, it's virtually a different band performing yeah. it. You've got different musicians. Obviously, the technology's changed almost out of recognition. How does, how does, how does this compare to the original? I, 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 it's very hard to tell, to be honest with you. I can't remember that well. I mean, I've listened to a couple of bootlegs, and we are um, in... in in terms of pure sort of music and professionalism, it's sort of light years ahead of what we ever did. In those days, we, we had the girls singers and we had Dick playing saxophone, which we have got again this time, different girls. Um, but we didn't have second keyboard players or second guitar players or percussion or anything like that. So it was a, it was a little bit um, simpler. There were, the, you know, there were more parts that were on the record were missing, which one hoped one made up for in general verve and enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. But it's very nice to be able to play it this way and, and sort of... Because like the, very, the last time we played Dark Side of the Moon was 1975, I think. No. My memory serves me well. No. So it's been an awful long time and, and it's nice to be able to play it the way it should be played, I suppose. <laughs> Wishing to, not really not wishing to reopen old wounds. Does it feel different performing it without Roger Waters? Yes, of course. Um, it's it's kind of odd doing the last two songs, Brain Damage and Eclipse, which are the two songs that Roger sang originally, and which means I have to sing them now. So that's slightly a different thing. And but we've been playing a lot of the songs from it anyway, so we're quite used to doing most of the stuff. But um, it does feel different. It was quite a, it was a quite, like I say, it was a, quite a good emotional moment the first night we did it. We were all quite nervous. It's something we've talked about, actually, for, for the, certainly for the last 10 years or so, that some of these records would benefit from being played as complete pieces, and, and Dark Side perhaps more than most of the others. Um, and it, it does have a different character if it's played in that way rather than piecemeal. And how does it feel now playing it? 20 years later? It's, it's still great fun. I mean, the interesting thing is that you find yourself uh, changing things and then um, going back to the record, having another listen, and perhaps changing, changing back again. Um, the tendency is to overplay it all the time. And the thing really is to find the elements in it that are important and, and sort of one doesn't just want to recreate the record live, or I, I, don't, I don't find that particularly amusing, but I think you want to create, recreate the feel of the record. Which parts of this show do you personally enjoy playing, performing the most? Um, I don't think there's any one specific part that's the, the greatest fun. I, mean, I suppose from a fun point of view, replaying astronomy, which uh, was something that, Astronomy Dominate? Yes, oh, which right. we uh, have played it. Uh, well, we've done it at a lot of the shows, and that's that's great fun because, again, it's something that has. Well, we haven't played live for 
20 odd years, I'd think. So, Rick, here we are back at Pink Floyd, back in Earl's Court for the first time since the wall. Do you have any thoughts on now and then as far as that goes? Is it, does it feel good to be back here? It feels, yes, it feels, of course, very good to be back. And for me, particularly, a lot, lot better. As uh, sorry, the wall, it was when I was going to leave, well, had left the band, but was going to, uh, you know, played out the wall concerts. So that was a pretty sad and pretty angry time for me. So this is rather different. So there was, so there was a spirit of band unity was. That wasn't so good then. Yeah. yeah. Right. No, it's completely different. But I'm very interested in having done this whole tour and has come from places like Rome. It's how the English audience is going to react actually. Mm. Are English audiences di more well, difficult? They can not difficult. They just don't respond in the same way. And we're so used to having incredible response, particularly in Italy and Spain. Um, I think we're going to have to get used to the English way of responding. Why do you think that Pink Floyd have managed to retain their hold on a youthful audience where other groups of your vintage, such as Jethro Tell, for example, haven't? I don't know. You tell me. What? I, 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 we have a sort of legendary status that uh, follows us around. I, I mean, and from what we have been doing in recent years on the last tour and on this tour, I mean, if I were an 18-year-old, and from what people actually say I mean, what people who've been to see it say about our show, I would think it was something worth going to see. So I don't really know. There's been a lot of talk here, anyway, about the way in which Pink Floyd are, 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 are in some ways, the forerunners of ambient music. Have you noticed that in, in the kind of audiences that you've been playing to? In the audiences? Mm. No, I haven't. I, I, I don't get all that. I don't, I don't really buy it, you know. For godfathers of ambient music or stuff. I mean, I, I don't see that we Some have an of the awful musicians themselves have actually said it, hasn't it? I mean, it hasn't just well, been I'm a I'm very happy mention. if we have been uh, influential in those ways, but um, I'm afraid it's not vastly reciprocated. Right. So <laughs> the, the Orb are not people that you recognise as your uh, musical progeny in a way? Um, not much, not, not really an awful lot. Having, uh, having been to see them, you were there. Mm. <laughs> Yes, it was hard to spot, I must say. How, is it, how does a show like this evolve over time? I mean, you've played, what, 120-odd dates so far? I, I'm not counting. I don't know. It's somewhere around a 100. A lot, anyway. Yeah, it's... Well, you just change it around. You try different things out, and some nights you come off saying, well, we won't try that again. And, so, and you move songs into different order, try them out, and gradually it seems to settle down into a, into a running order and a the choice of songs that you, you kind of enjoy doing a bit more. But we still change it around. So. And is there room in a show which is obviously, it has to be pretty tightly organised, is there room for a lot of musical improvisation when you're actually up there or are you pretty much running along tracks once you start? Well, we don't run to any uh, codes or specific time things. The films and things aren't actually in specific sync. Um, so there are moments which have to uh, be Right, and then, but most of the time we're fairly free to do as we please. The computerised lighting cues and so on and so forth are are on a button. So when you want to change, you get to that point and change. You don't, you know, it's not all it's not all down to the clock. It's been really great fun doing this tour, and uh, uh, in some ways, I think we'll all miss it when we start. The way these things work, it's it's you have to compress shows into as small a time as possible and um, it's about enough for me for the time being. Seven months but without any breaks and 
which I think really is a bit too long. Um, but I'm looking forward to the end, of course. But I'm also sad because I don't know when the next tour will be. And it's always sad to finish a tour, particularly this one that's been so successful and happy. We're not retiring, but uh, I don't know what we're going to do or when. I think it's very easy to get stuck in the cycle of spend a year recording and then spend a year and a half um, touring and then go on holiday for a year or two years or three years or five years. But uh, I'd, I think it would probably be better for us creatively uh, to, um, to do some smaller scale... Um, I mean, it could be shows, it could be recording, it could be a record that isn't... I've, I've no idea what it would be, but I think most of us would like to avoid entering that cycle, the sort of two-and-a-half-year cycle.